you. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Richardson. I'm in a science education at the University of Cincinnati and also the executive director of the International Association for Geoscience Diversity. I am a Ohio State alum and I started the IAGD as a nonprofit while I was here working on my dissertation in 2008. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the evolution of uh, the geosciences, especially geoscience education, as we focus, as the work that we do in the IAGD focuses specifically on access and inclusion for students, for geoscience practitioners, for professionals uh, with disabilities. Um, uh, the geosciences specifically is a field intensive um, science that often lends itself to people who are able bodied at least the traditional assumption of such. And so we're trying to break that barrier down. So we're gonna talk about how not everybody learns the science the same way. And I'm gonna show you some examples of, of what that might look like. So first thing, I want, you to, I, want, I want us all to think about inclusion. So I want you to think personally about what you did when you came here today, all right? You came up, registration, you probably introduced yourself to someone at registration, right? Not everyone in here knows everybody. So what did you do specifically? Did you seek someone out that you didn't know to introduce yourself? Did you sit with someone that you didn't know at breakfast? Did you strike up a conversation? How many did? All right, kinda, all right. You sound awfully outgoing, so I can believe it. All right. Okay, perfect, there you go. Did you finish your bingo card? Congratulations. Excellent. All right. This isn't common. That's not common, right? Because why? Anybody want to guess why we don't do that? Why we don't seek out people? Uh, a lot of it. Exactly. It's uncomfortable, isn't it? It's uncomfortable for anyone to go up to someone who doesn't look like you, who doesn't act like you, and then someone who might not think like you, learn like you, right, speak like you. It's very uncomfortable. So when we think about that, what does it mean truly? The work that we do, what does it mean to be inclusive? What is inclusion? Definition of that out for me. Including everybody, yes. That sounds like it came right out of the dictionary. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. <laughs> okay. okay. So inclusion means that everyone has a seat, right? Everybody is involved. So I always like to say we've heard these things before, right? Feeling like you're included or being. Uh, so when we talk about accessibility, which was one of the three themes this morning that we've talked about already, versus inclusion, access is that you have a seat at the table and inclusion is being invited to play the game, right? Having a ticket to the dance or being invited to dance, right? And so when we think about inclusion versus access, inclusion is a lot more, uh, a lot more defined in terms of the integration into something. Access is one thing, inclusion is a lot more meaningful. When you look at, if you type in anything, this was, these were pictures that I, uh, that I looked up from an ecology talk that I was given once. And so I said, well, I don't know anything about ecology, so I'm going to look it up. I, I was asked to give a talk to the British Ecological Society, and I said, I don't know anything about ecology. So I looked up pictures, and I'm like, wow, these look great, don't they? Thank you. Exactly. You look at this, and what do we see? We see um, a lot of <laughs> we see a lot of average. We see a lot of dirt. We, everything's outdoors, wet. Some people might see miserable. Although we see a lot of smiles, right? If I'm a wheelchair user, would I see a sense of belonging here? Probably not. Would I?
Yep. And so the picture here in the trees, I have seen a lot of that. I have seen a lot of, of, of pictures where people actually do get into the canopies, um, the, the accessibility of it. But if you then look specifically, you do a search for geology field work. And these are some common pictures that you see. And again, if I go to a website, any website, there was a paper that just came out, Julie Sexton from Northern Colorado, just, pu just published a paper maybe three or four years ago on the image that we portray on websites. What are we promoting? These are common pictures that come right off the websites. Everything's able-bodied, physically demanding, right? Mountains. It's like, to be a geologist, you have to be an adventurer. And so, for a student who doesn't fit that model, passage than a meaningful learning experience. And so when I did field work, when I did my field camp, and I graduated from Wright State University with my undergrad in geology, I did six weeks of field, and I can tell you everything that was miserable about those six weeks. Right now that I think back about it, the things that are most that I remember easily I think about the learning experience. I remember hanging out with a bunch of people. I remember that not going well a lot of times. Um, but the learning isn't what's most meaningful there. It's the rite of passage. It's like, hey, where did you do your field work? Field camp. Network. So if we think about a student's identity, we realize that a student's identity in a geosciences or in any field-based discipline is very defined by the field work. And so anyone who doesn't fit that able-bodied mindset, that mentality, someone who doesn't have an opportunity to go out and develop that identity is their okay? Field-based discipline, you look it up, traditionally speaking, you're going to see the same thing. And so the IEGD, the work that I do, um, is trying to dispel this, this myth, this traditional myth. So if we think about ability on a continuum, fall continuum somewhere, all of us. And so we realize not a deficit, and I realize I'm speaking to the choir right now, but it's a part of the human condition. And so why is it that all uh, disciplines, all science disciplines, field-based disciplines, that everything um, aligns to a sense of normal? What is normal? What is normal? Is there normal? Yes. No, there's not. <laughs> exactly. No one is normal. There's no such thing. It's a social construct. In higher education, in any training program, we try to find that normal, right? Whenever we have a, a new class coming in, right? The University of Cincinnati and the orientations uh, that, are, that are happening right now for new students that are starting this fall, they're so proud because their ACT scores are higher than they've ever been. And so the, the academic excellence of these students are so high. Is that normal? Is that what the normal, is that what we're seeking to? Because what we're not talking about is how inclusive we're being how accessible we're being, how we're bringing in students that don't fit that same thing, right? So if we, th we see this here, uh, the continuum from able to not able, seeing, hearing, walking, reading print, writing with pen or pencil, communicating verbally, tuning out distractions, the ability to learn, man manage your physical or mental health, all fall on that continuum, right? It's a spectrum. And every one of these, each one of us individually, that needle move one way or another on the spectrum. And so the, the, the programs that we design to train students, either in K-12 or in higher education, needs to be flexible to enable this movement along that continuum. So the idea here is diversity is not the issue. What is the issue? Access is one of them. Inclusion? Right? Anybody else? Social justice? Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. That's right. They're not given opportunities to develop that identity. Right? So diversity is the issue. Diversity is all around us. It's how we're tapping into that diversity, how we're utilizing the potential, how we're bringing in the diverse perspectives that's going to drive scientific innovation. Right? That's a cultural mindset that we need to change. So we need to think about this. As a practitioner, all of us either are or will be soon a practitioner of science. We need to think beyond the boundaries of our own beliefs and experiences, which is where bias and stereotype and all these things show up, okay? My experiences aren't the same as Gabby's experiences, right? And so we see things, we do work together, and we see things very differently. She makes me a better person because of that. So let me introduce you to the IEGD, and these stickers are available. We have, we will have, we have a lot of these stickers, so come pick one up. The IGD started in 2008 as a, uh, an organization, uh, and, and Tiffany, and she, she and I graduated from here at the same time. It was an organization to share resources. I realized that, that there was an issue here, that someone who might have had a visual disability would show up to an introductory level geology course, and there's no support for that. You go to your Office of Accessibility Services, and they're like, we just handle testing. Good luck. And so an instructor would have to figure it out. How are they going to figure out how to support that student in a class? Well, they did, and they would do a really great job. And then when that student passed the class, all those really great things that they developed probably went into a drawer someplace never to be seen again. And then somebody on the other side of the country had the same situation, looking for resources. There were no resources to be found. They had to figure it out on their own. So realizing this, we started this. This was a national advisory for geoscience diversity, which was the very first title. It was a network of people sharing these ideas and resources. That's all it was. Fast forward it now. We're 11 years into it. We're represented in about 40 different countries around the world. And we have gone from just it being a network, sharing resources for, for instructors to student communities and offering professional development workshops and accessible field trips, which I'm going to show you a few pictures from. All right. And last summer, June of last year, at the Geological Society of London, we kicked off the very first chapter. DIG UK is a chapter of the IAGD in the UK. So I feel free to look that up. So what I wanted to talk to you about is how through these experiences, these accessible field courses, how we develop or we design for inclusive practice, right? So the very first thing that we do when I talk to anyone, I go to that instructor, that the, the traditional field geologist who says it can't be done. I'm like, what are the real objectives, the learning objectives of your course, right? I'm sure that it isn't to climb to the highest mountain to pick a piece of rock that you can find at the bottom. I'm sure that's not the objective. What's the real objective? So we consider those primary learning objectives. And then we use universal design, multiple representation, to help design to align to the student's needs and abilities. Okay? Understanding, and I just said this a little bit ago, the diverse perspectives enable scientific innovation. Right? This if anybody's had seen a talk from mine, this is a picture that's commonly shown. Uh, this was from my dissertation work. I took six students, power wheelchairs, into Mammoth Cave National Park in 2010. Um, the idea here was to give them the authentic experience to be able to relate that to the virtual reality simulation that we were creating to be able to establish another representation of access. So here's a picture of them, and the, the real issue here was, was a year and a half of logistical planning just to get these students into the cave, actually. I had to get permission from the U.S. Department of the Interior, and then Mammoth Cave had to tell me when they I 
I, I, I could use a lot of four-letter four words that came out of the students when that was said. They were not happy about that. They didn't understand. But thinking back about it now, they realized that Mammoth Cave was not set up to be able to support the public except in an accessible tour, which now, fast forward, they do offer an accessible tour route. If anybody has Mammoth Cave or if you want to go, they do have an accessible option. Okay. All right. All right. So the idea here of the course itself was active participation. We wanted students to be able to actively participate. It wasn't about um, just a show and tell. I didn't want to take them into the cave and just actually have them see what it was all about. I wanted them to actually behave more as a geoscience practitioner. Just keep in mind that that's plugged in there. And while we wait for that to come back, anybody have a good joke? Right, right. So yeah, the laboratory desks are, are meant to be if you're standing up for it, right? Not when you're wheeling up to it. Um, absolutely, There's a, there is a, a big issue with all lab settings, not just chemistry, but good. Thank you, thank you. Geology does rock. <laughs> no, it's good, that's good. Okay, so. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I'll just move this over here. Just move this. That's okay. I think we'll go with this right now. So is, is everybody able to see this? Okay, and I'm not standing right, so I can move more. Okay. All right. So the idea here was that, that it needed to be an active participation experience for the students. We, I, I had them going in, and we had a section of the cave that they were required to map. So they learned mapping skills. None of these students were geology majors. None of them were science majors, right? So they, they, they took me up on this opportunity to go in and see something they never had s experienced before. Um, I like to show this picture because the, two, the, the, gr the girls group separated, the guys group separated. The ladies were a lot more organized than the guys. <laughs> right? That's typical. But it was. It was a collaborative experience. It was doing something they never had done. It was sharing their own perspectives of doing the science together. All right? When they got back, they immediately took the data that they had collected and they created a map. And on the, on the left-hand side, you see the map that was created by the students. There's section one and section two. They were completely autonomous while they were mapping and they fit perfectly together. The, the call-out box here, the red box, is the actual section of the cave. This is the, the actual cave map. Um, and, and the students, this was my first experience where I did the work, and I will never forget how to map a cave. I loved mapping the cave and had such a feeling of accomplishment, feeling of accomplishment when the boys' map fit perfectly to ours. All right, this is giving somebody an experience that they had never had, and honestly, this is what completely changed the perspective of what I needed to do moving forward. And so we did um, uh, like focus group and individual interviews at the end. Uh, one of the students I loved that the instructors were prepared for extremely positive attitudes about working with us. There was absolutely no sense or feeling that we were a nuisance, burden, or an overall pain to be taught because of our different needs. And so this is a very common, some are probably very aware of this, you feel like a burden when you don't fit that normal that most instructors are teaching to. 
So why do we focus on the primary outcomes? If we look at, especially in a field-based discipline, we look at a lot of the physical rigor that comes along with doing any field-based science. Climbing to the top of the mountain, right, is an example. If there's a lot of physical rigor, the retention of the content or the work that you're doing is going to be reduced, right? If you're out running a marathon and then you have to read a passage and answer the questions, do you really think you're going to do well on that? I don't know about you, but I haven't ran a marathon in a while. All right? So if you increase academic rigor, minimize physical rigor, your content retention is going to go up if you're really just focusing on the objectives there. You know, and then identify the triggers of cognitive load. Anybody know what cognitive load is? Yes, it is. What is cognitive load, you think? Do you play video games? Yeah, yeah. I bet your video games are a lot more complicated than the ones I used to play. Right? I played Pong. <laughs> we had one choice. <laughs> yeah, no, I like that one too. And so the issue here is cognitive load is when there's so much going on, I don't know what to focus on, right? Yeah, right. A really great example of this, when I was actually in my undergrad, we were on the side of a road in an outcrop, and we're trying to listen to the instructor talk about the rocks in front of us. Behind us, these cars are flying by, Right, we're maybe five feet off the road. And then, out of nowhere, comes this swarm of ladybugs attacking us. Right? And if you've ever had ladybugs attack you, bite. They bite. And so, how much of that lecture did any of us listen to? That was cognitive load. There's too much going on. We had no way of focusing on that. So, if we identify what triggers cognitive load, we can minimize content retention is going to go up as well. So the next thing, identifying barriers to active participation. So the biggest thing that I want to call out here is that whenever I talk to any faculty member, I always say full participation does not mean 100% access. The biggest issue for a traditional field-based instructor is that they have to have every student do every activity. And that's not the case. And I'm going to show you some examples of this as soon as I make sure we have time. All right, so example, I took a trip, I took a group of people. This was students and faculty members uh, on a field course in British Columbia. This was one of our stops. And if you can notice, down by the water on the floodplain, there are people down there. But not everybody could get down on that floodplain, OK? So we had different vantage points, and we were talking about the science from different perspectives. When everybody came back, they brought examples of things that they had seen. And this is where we had our debriefing session. You don't teach to one group versus the other. You wait till the entire group comes back, and then you teach. And then people share their perspectives and their ideas and things that they've, that they've found, right? The cool thing about this was that none of us could get to where we were supposed to be here. If you can look in the background at the rock, the exposed rock there, that's a dam, an ice dam that was created a long time ago when a volcano erupted next to a glacier, right? And so now this ice dam is eroding to the point where a failure is imminent, and they don't even let anybody camp out here. This is Garibaldi Park on the way up to Whistler. and so. We were looking all over the place for examples of, of the material coming off of that ice dam. None of us could get up there. This is also like studying Mars. Has anybody been to Mars? But yet we know a lot about it, don't we? Okay, and so other instances on this trip were just mixed ability grouping, getting people to share those resources, share their ideas, share their perspectives. The bottom right corner is a picture I like to share. This was a fake photo. What was really cool about this trip is we made uh, some tactile versions of the geologic maps that we were using of Vancouver. 
And so when I saw one of our students using said map, I said, that's excellent. Can you hold it up so I could take a picture of you? It's a perfect picture. This is a fake picture. Why? Because she doesn't need to look at that map like I do. She was using the map right here. This is when I took a picture of the group and realized, oh, I'm glad you're holding the map. Can you hold it up so it looks like you're using the map? And then she told me, after I took the picture, she humored me. She said I was using the map. Chris is hard reality. You may be knowledgeable about something, but you are not always the expert. And we need to think about that. No matter how much we know about something, there's always something else to learn. I learn something new every single day. And so my perspectives, my abilities are a lot different than everybody else's abilities. And your abilities are a lot different than mine. Right? And the open-mindedness is something that we all need to be aware of. And that's hard for some people to realize that not everybody is like you. And then finally, integrating tools to minimize these barriers, enhance active participation and engagement. This is where we started to use some technology to be able to develop a, an inclusive community of learning. Uh, an NSF project, National Science Foundation project we have that's just ending, uh, we took a group of students to several different locations. This one happened to be in northern Arizona. And we started using GoPros and different ways of capturing the experience because there were a lot of locations here that not everybody could get to. And we knew that. Understanding that full participation does not mean 100% access. This is SP Crater uh, in Flagstaff, if anybody's been to Flagstaff. This is a volcanic crater. Obviously, you're not going to get a lot of people at the top of this thing. It's bigger than it looks. Bigger than it looks. Ivan, did you make it to the top? Yeah, I didn't make it to the top. This is from the top. You can see right into the crater. So here we were using iPads to communicate and walkie-talkies to communicate in real time back to people at the base. And I'm going to give this a try to see if it works. All right, here we go. Definitely a couple minutes. Kind of hard to hear. Right now. So, so I will kind of paraphrase what we're seeing here. Um, the students in the van. So we had a, a, a few wheelchair uh, uh, people who utilized wheelchairs on the trip. They obviously weren't going to make it to the top. Yeah, we have a. We could ask them like what the texture of the flow is. From here, it looks like an aha, but. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, so the, uh, is it, oh, uh, the flow at the top, right? So we're looking at it from the stream. It looks like it's an aha, but can you guys confirm that? Uh, but there's also a fair bit of scoring up here as well. So uh, there's a lot of sort of orangish red sage material with lots of vesicles, cool. a lot of light. So it's a combination of aha and scoria. Okay, so what was happening here is there was teachers, so one of our faculty members did make it to the top, this one didn't, and he was teaching from the top, the people who could not physically get up there. The issue here was that there was a lot of delay, was about a two minute delay in the video, the communication, the walkie talkie communication was in real time, the video was really lagged, right? Taking the same group a year later, we went to Western Ireland, which was beautiful, uh, this is a really quick shot of one of the field sites that we took as a drone shot from the field site. Obviously not very accessible. Everything that you see there is a bog, so you'd lose your boots if you walked across that. Um, beautiful, beautiful site. The idea here was to split the group. So we had students that were more mobile than other students. And then we used this, oh, it was an old train trestle. We used this train trestle to have students who are less mobile actually do the, the geologic mapping while other ones would go over by the lake. But this time, we established, we're in the middle of nowhere Ireland, by the way, we established our own wireless network, which was very cool. Um, it was like using the internet without being on the internet. But what this helped us do was use the iPads and the communication, take to the, the, the capabilities of the iPads um, to be able to communicate back and forth along with the video. 
So here's the train trestle, students doing mapping of the rocks along the train trestle. And then down by the lake, more students were, this is a meta, meta picture of a student taking a picture of the picture that they were sending back to the students. Uh, it was very cool to be able to share that experience back and forth. So students were responsible for each of their locations. And then they had to come back together and start creating the map of the location. Teams. The site that we went to is uh, Renville Point on the Atlantic Ocean. Obviously, you're not going to get chairs on that, right? This is an old glacial outwash. We set up, if you see on the left side of the picture there, we set up uh, the wireless network again. Um, and I'll play this very quickly. Sean has the stream on his iPad, so he's able to split screen and type as he sees the stream. So I'm just kind of watching upside down. So just be aware of that for the interpretation later. We have everything on Photosync visible now. We're about to send three more. There you go. Look, they have a scale one too. Oh, that's good. Oh, wow, that's huge. Yeah. The, the air beam didn't really show that that's how high the wall was. It's cool though, because that's all that all has to be exposed by wind and waves, mm -hmm. most of the wave activity. But it's cool because it doesn't look exactly lithified yet. Mm -hmm. It could be that it's just erosion and it's lithified, except on this outer surface too. Uh -huh. Yeah, we're just discussing the photos as we're, they come in or as they've been up here, and we're just able to see them now. So we have some good discussion on our end. Uh, just talking about the lithification of the big wall with you used as scale. So the idea here was that the, the project teams were separated now, and you, you didn't have the faculty interjecting. The project teams were communicating through the technology and sharing their ideas and their, their resources and, and, again, creating that map. I took the same group again to Mount St. Helens that following fall, used the same technology, to be able to share back the images from the field as a wet day, right? Typical Seattle type weather, wet day, cold, snowing on us part of the day. Um, not fun at all, not fun at all. It's fun to now that we're back. Uh, the following fall, or I'm sorry, last summer, I had an experience that I had never had before, and that was to actually follow a student with autism uh, doing a field course in Belize. And so his job, he was actually, um, he was actually selected to participate in this uh, research experience for undergrads where he had to use drones to map islands on the barrier reef. It was a really tough job, really tough job, really tough. And, okay, all right, but so I had to go down and support him. This was, he was so excited to be able to do this. He's an undergraduate student in geography and all he wanted to do was fly those drones. This was a picture of the very first experience he was able to fly the drones, right? Um, and there were a lot of challenges with this because as part of this project, he had to go around the community and interview community members about their science, about the, the islands, about their culture, right? So if you can imagine an autistic student interviewing community members in a foreign country, right? So don't, so, so when somebody comes up to me and says you can't do it, I say, you can do it. This is a picture of him out on one of the islands. That was one of his instructors to his left, and I believe he was telling him to be quiet and let him do his work. <laughs> At least that's what the picture shows. But what was really cool, we went back on one of the days to one of the, to the public library, and we're on a, we're a really small village here. And it was a day where we were sharing the science that we were doing, and these children, village were glued to him as he explained the science and the things that he was doing. He was so excited about this. It was a great experience for all of us. And then last fall, another experience real quick. I took students, or I, I was invited to join a group of people um, in Wales on the Isle of Anglesey in the UK, where we utilized, again, the evolution of this, this integration of technology into create a sense of community. Now, obviously, you're not going to get chairs down here either. And the seals were watching us all day, too. It was pretty cool. All right. It was cool. It was cool. So we started using video cameras now, and we, uh, we, we sent that 
the images and the videos back directly to students who were in a van that physically could not get out and join us on some of these sites. But what was cool about this is we used that multiple representation, a little rep representation, that the students who were in the vans had printouts and descriptions and hand samples and thin sections of the rock types that we were seeing and all of these other resources that students who were actually at the rocks did not have. So they were able to make a lot more observations than the other students were. They were responsible for sharing what they found out from each of the sites as well, right? So the bottom left-hand corner, you see actual video, live video from the field sites themselves. They had uh, real-time communication to be able to share um, ideas and ask questions and those kinds of things. And then they made their observations on the resources, using the resources that they had. The, the instructors were able to communicate using an audio tour guide system. If anybody's ever been to like the, the US Capitol and gone on a tour like that, and you put a headphone in and the tour guide can talk to you. So we utilized one of these. It worked out really well. But we had to use one of those dead cat microphone buffers for the wind. But they didn't call it dead cat, they call it dead chinchilla. <laughs> so sites and the way that they were able to send video back to the students. So a couple of quotes here from various projects that we've been on. Uh, it was an even playing field for everyone today. Uh, everybody today, there were no disabilities. Everybody was on the same page, and we were all equal. I really needed this trip because I got a whole boost of confidence. There were so many options, and your experience and observations were just as valuable as everyone else's. And this bottom one, I really love this one. It was from an actual traditional field geologist who has now acquired a disability through age. And for him to say it was emotional to get back into the field. It's him being able to continue doing his science, right? So how do we include everything we do from promotion, recruitment, selection of students, language that we use and all of our promotional materials. We communicate with students early and often. We let them know what we're going to do and we have them help us figure out how we're going to do it. It's not me with my perspectives and my biases and stereotypes telling students what we're going to do. The students have a big role in that. Flexibility, collaborative planning, contingency plans. Um, one of the days in, in the UK, it just poured rain on us, and we had a virtual simulation from one of the field sites that we used. Active mentoring, faculty to student, student to student, and student to faculty. All of the faculty that go on these trips are learning right from the students as well. Mixed ability grouping, universal design, Inclusive instruction at all times. You wait till everybody's back together before you talk about anything that was done. And then when we'll integrate technology to be able to provide that inclusion. Some project support that we've had along the way. One plug, shameless plug. Uh, the IGD gives an award. It's called the Inclusive Geoscience Education and Research Award. We give this award, this, this will be our third year giving it. Anyone doing any work sciences or in the earth sciences that is working to promote access and inclusion please let us know we want to we want to celebrate them right it comes with a, a little financial prize lovely plaque and a, some guy that awards never mind you can go to the ig.org slash Iger to learn more about this award and make sure you stop by and get a sticker today at the booth. Thank you all. It is now 10.04. I know we got a little bit of a later start and a hiccup, but five minutes. Does anybody have any questions? Any thoughts? Tiffany? So Tiffany's question was, do we see a trend So that we've done or domestically with students with 
who have blind or low vision. But we did a work internationally with this. Um, primarily because I think that it's, well, the, the one international, international was that Anglesey trip. And there was, it, they weren't recruited, they didn't sign up. It was, it was inclusive in the promotion of the project, but we didn't get, we had, uh, we had autism, we had physical disabilities, we had um, mental health issues on, in that group, but no visual disabilities. Um, it's not that we're not recruiting for it, it's just not, there, nobody was signing up for it. So, Mitch? Transportation, no, because we were able to select, you know, the biggest issue with transportation is finding a, a company that will rent to you, right? That was a big issue in Ireland. There was only one company in the entire country that would rent an accessible vehicle to you and allow you to drive it. And so I had to fly into Dublin and drive to Shannon just because of the vehicles. But there, I don't think there's an issue with transportation other than finding the, the, the appropriate. You have somebody fly into Cincinnati for a meeting and there, there's no way of picking them up through Uber or Lyft, right? The issue is finding companies that, that you can get the vehicles from. I think one of the biggest issues for Ireland and for Arizona with that same group are issues of student needs that I have not anticipated, and that's where the flexibility and the contingency planning comes in, right? Such as a student who cannot regulate his own body temperature below his injury site, and you take him to Arizona, <laughs> and then you take him to wet, cold Ireland. So we had to figure that out pretty quickly. Um, so he can't shiver and he can't sweat. And your body temperature starts to go up in Arizona. There was a few times where we had to throw him in, a, uh, in the car to cool him back down. But Yes. Good to see you, Margo. Um, I, so he, the issue with this is now is that we're trying to make that stepwise to where we're bringing in more business. So a lot of the things that we're doing in, industry, or in the IGD is starting to partner with those industries as a way of creating a pathway for these students. So you get them into higher education, right? The problem is if we're waiting to get them into higher education, we probably lost 99% of them along the way. But for those who are in higher education, we need to be able to show them that there is a pathway to go into industry, um, specifically in the earth science disciplines. I think the biggest issue right now is, is not just identifying those industries, but training them on how to accommodate their workforce, uh, especially a workforce that doesn't work a nine to five job. If a, a, an employee that, that might have autism might be on the spectrum, that doesn't work like the rest of this traditional, normal workforce might. And so uh, making sure that the, the industries or the companies that we're, that we're working with know how to support their employees is, is one of the biggest issues. Yes. I have not. Excellent. So we do work with now, the now called Disability In, which was used, used to be the U United States Business Leadership Network, and we do work with them. They do very similar things, um, but I will, I will check that out, yeah. Any other questions? Two slides. Three slides. And I'll throw up a slide, the very last slide is just a, a list of, of references if anybody wants to take a picture of that. Any other questions? I'm sorry? Yes, you can email me. Any other questions? Yes. Welcome. 
I have a business card for you. Oh, we can find somebody up there. Yep. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a big question. Um, a lot of people shy away from this work because of li li liability, right? Uh, we do have IAGD members in Wisconsin, and I can put you in touch with them. Thank you. Let me throw this last slide. Did you get all these up? Let me throw this last slide up here for you. If anyone wants to take a picture of all that work, uh, this is, these are uh, publications that where everything that you saw today uh, have come from. So thank you all. I really appreciate your time. Yep, so on a couple of the projects that you saw, we did have a couple of deaf students. Um, and I was really excited, the Vancouver one specifically, I was really excited that we had it all figured out. I had a, a, an ASL interpreter that was, that was scheduled to come with us, and then when the student arrived, he was from India. <laughs> and so we had, this is where that flexibility and contingency comes in, we had to figure that out, and, and we, did a, we, did a, we did a bang up job to do that. Um, we have worked with a lot of students who are who have hearing disabilities. Yes. Now I'm curious. Would it be possible to get their names to invite them to come to this presentation to my students at my school? Is Abs that absolutely. Where are you located? Here. here? Okay. Um, yes, I, I I'll put you in touch with them. They're not from here in the area, but we could figure that out. Thank you, thank you. Thank you all.